title of today's message is A New Standard of Giving. A New Standard of Giving. Next to the baptism in the Holy Spirit, salvation at first, of course, next to salvation, and then the baptism in the Holy Spirit. If there's one thing I wish I could impart to all believers everywhere, it would be this. Lord, teach me to be a generous giver. Teach me to be a generous giver. Let's pray. Father, we bless you and we thank you for the presence of the Spirit and the move of the Spirit through the gift of tongues and interpretation. We thank you for that encouragement to get out in the streets and win people to Jesus. We thank you for that, Lord, and we ask you to bless this sermon as well. Anoint it as your word. May it go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit and accomplish the deed that you want it to accomplish. Have your purpose fulfilled in all of our lives through this word today. In Jesus' name, amen. What defines generous giving? Generous giving is defined as, by me as liberal giving that surpasses even the level of a tithe. A tithe is 10% of your income. Generous givers give above the tithe, not only to their church, but also to its missionaries, its outreaches, its southern programs, its ministries. And they also give to people in the community that have need. And so you're giving above your tithe level. You're, becoming, you're working on becoming a generous giver. The tithe is the Lord's, the scripture teaches us. And it's paid through your local temple or your local church. If you're a member of city church or you attend city church, that means you would bring your tithe here. If you're a member of some other church, then you would take your tithe there and drop your tithe in their offering place. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 12, the Bible says, Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? God was speaking very sternly to Israel who had withheld their tithe and had followed false idols. You have cheated me out of tithes and offerings due to me. The tithe belongs to the Lord. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Malachi 3, 8 through 12 in the New Living Translation, version 2. Sometimes people get frustrated with life and they say, why is everything going wrong? And one of the first questions I like to ask them when they come for counseling is, are you paying your tithe? Because the Lord promises to bless people who pay their tithe. Otherwise, you can expect a lot of frustration and aggravation in life because God expects you to pay what belongs to him. Because the, the money that you have is not your money, it's God's money. It comes from him. He is your source. I believe the word of God makes it clear that that we are also the tithe, but tithing is the minimum. Tithing is the minimum, the first milestone to be reached on your way to becoming a generous giver. Tithing is not the end all of our giving. People begin to worship the Lord and they come in, they get saved, and they want to give them the offering and they give whatever they feel led to give. Then they begin to hear teaching about tithing and they move up to a tithing level. But that's not the end all. If you're tithing and tithing only, you're missing an opportunity for an advanced blessing, a greater increase from the Lord. Tithing is the minimum, the first milestone to be reached, but it's not the end all of all our giving. I look at tithing as entry-level giving. So we love it when you give in the offering. We need that, and we appreciate it so very much. It helps us pay the bills. Our light bills have been very high this year, power bills, as yours have with inflation. So we need a little extra right now during this season. But that's not why I'm preaching this message. I'm preaching this message because the Lord led me to. Tithing is entry-level giving. A new standard of giving is to become a generous giver. Becoming a generous giver doesn't mean you won't face challenges and hardships. So if I tithe, I won't have any problems, right? Oh, you may still face some struggles in life. Abraham was a tither and believed God for a son. For 100 years, he's 100 years old. At age 100, God promised Abraham that he was going to realize that promise that he gave to him so many years ago. And he, he would have a son born by that season next year. And his wife was 99. And Abraham was 100, and they both chuckled in their heart and said, how can that be? We're both out of age to have a baby, and we're too old. Just goes to show you old people, you're never too old. God can do anything. 
So he did for Abraham and Sarah, his wife. The promise came true when Isaac was born. But we believe God blesses the tithe. It does not shield us from seeming delays in the promise of God or the trials of life that come to us. Just ask Abraham and ask Job. Job was a godly, righteous man. He gave of his offerings freely to the Lord. He blessed the Lord with everything that was in him. He prayed for his children because they might have committed a sin. He wanted them to live holy and righteous before God. And so when he lost everything, his wife said, why don't you curse God and just die? And he said, how can I do that? God's the only one I've got to turn to right now. So I'm not going to do that at all. Abraham was already a tither when he was required to give away any of something that any one of us would think God would never ask us to do. And that would be to sacrifice our children to him. He asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son Isaac, whom he loved, to get into the mountain and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which he would tell him of. So Abraham obeyed. Sacrifice was required and Abraham rose to the occasion. In response to God's command to sacrifice his son, Abraham did not hold back. He didn't falter. Just as the knife was raised up over his son, God called to him from the bushes and said, Abraham, Abraham, stop. And there was a ram provided in the thicket to be the sacrifice for Isaac. Kind of models for us Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Isaac was the son of promise, the one through whom the nations were to come, through who Messiah was to come. That's a big ask from God. But Abraham followed through with it. Abraham obeyed. Here are some takeaways for you from that story. Number one, don't convince yourself God will not ask you to join the ranks of generous givers. See, the amount of income that you have does not determine the level of your giving. The amount of heart for God you have determines how you give. You begin with the tithe and you go beyond that and you give more and more to people that you love, to the kingdom of God, and help advance the kingdom cause. So don't convince yourself God will not ask you to join the ranks of those who are generous givers. But I'm on a limited income. Don't think that God still won't ask you to be a generous giver. I'm on limited income. I don't make that much money. Don't think God won't ask you to participate in being a generous giver. He will. Don't convince yourself God will not ask more than the minimum required. Don't convince yourself God does not have the right to require more of his children. More of me, more of you. Don't convince yourself God will not ask you for sacrifice even though you already tithe. People wonder about tithing. They have some disagreements with it at times. So they have questions. One of the questions I've heard is, do we tithe on the gross or do we tithe on the net when it comes to giving a tithe? Do we pay tithes on money that's mandated to be withheld by the federal government? I think whatever a person makes is what the government bases a person's tax on. Is it a stretch to say that your gross amount is your income when you apply for a loan? If you go apply for a car loan, you go apply for a home loan at the bank, they want to know what you make, not what you take home. They won't ask you how much you take home. They'll ask you how much you make, especially if it's a car salesman. They don't even ask what you take home. Now they say, what can you afford? What kind of note are you looking at? If a loan requires a gross amount, then certainly a tithe does. Look at it another way. What if you paid zero taxes ever? What if you didn't have withholding? What if it never existed? What would you tithe on then? If you made $1,000 a week and 200 of it went out for taxes and you tithed 100, that would leave you with 700 that week to work with. But if you didn't have any withholding and you made $1,000 a week, then your tithe would still be $100. And you'd have 900 to work with. So don't say to God, you're asking too much. Say to the government, you're asking too much. Because that's the standard that should be operated by. God asks for 10% and then become a generous giver beyond that. So don't fall for that argument. For those who argue the tithing is not mentioned in the New Testament, It is mentioned in the New Testament that they've overlooked the two scriptures that are in there, maybe three. How can I go wrong by giving to God 10% of my gross income? That's a win-win proposition. If I'm wrong about tithing in the New Testament, I still come out blessed because we give a tithe and above. 
If I'm right, then I've obeyed God and will be blessed even more. Either way, I win. It's a win-win. So I want to encourage you to consider those arguments for those of you that don't tithe and don't live on the level of a generous giver and begin to ask the Lord, ask the Lord what he would want you to do. Where did the tithe originate? Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God. He is blessed and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered enemies into his hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Abraham gave him tithe of the victory that he won over the kings of Salem. And those that were kings, I'm sorry, the kings of Gomorrah. And that whole region, there were five kings that he conquered. Abraham initiated the tithe long before the law was ever given to Israel. So when you hear the argument, tithing is the law, it's not New Testament. It was actually began before the law ever came. And something like that carries through even after the law. And now we're under grace. The law has much to say about bringing your tithe to the Lord. But God had imparted the concept to Abraham generations before it was commanded in the law. Robert Morris said in one of his great teachings of the blessed life, the grace always requires more. Many argue that we're no longer under the law. We are under grace. Therefore, we can give just what we want to give. It's up to us to measure our standard of giving. Some use that thinking as an excuse to hold out on God or to maintain control of the money. Because when you release money into the church's hands, that's where you bring your tithe. And you have to trust the stewardship of the house to those who are in leadership to take care of that money and use it wisely. Some use it, thinking, use it as an excuse to hold out on God or maintain control of their money. Generous givers do not hold out on God, but rise to the greatest level of generous giving or the greatest level of need. In the New Testament, it's commanded. In the uh, Old Testament, it's commanded. In the New Testament, it's kind of requested. The law is our teacher, our schoolmaster. It shows us how to live for Christ. And there's plenty of scriptures in the New Testament that tell you how to live for Jesus. But in the Old Testament, you can get some moral standards and some guidelines as well. Many argue we're not under the law, not under the law but we know we're to be generous givers. Hezekiah instructed the people to you know, come and prepare the temple for worship and to feed the priesthood and do for them in the ministry they were to be able to receive so they could sustain themselves in the, in the temple operation. So Hezekiah appointed the courses of the priests and the Levites after their courses. Every man according to his service, the priests and Levites for burnt offerings and for peace offerings to minister and to give thanks and to praise in the gates of the tents of the Lord. He appointed also the king's portion of his substance for the burnt offerings, to wit, for the morning and evening burnt sacrifices and offerings for the Sabbaths and for the new moons and for the set feasts as it is written in the law of the Lord. Moreover, he commanded the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priest and the Levites that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. As soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, oil, and honey, and all the increase of the field. And the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. And concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought in the tithe of oxen and sheep and the tithe of holy things which were concentrated un consecrated unto the Lord their God, and laid them by heaps. In the third month they began to lay the foundation of the heaps and finished them in the seventh month. When Hezekiah and the princes came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people. Hezekiah questioned with the priests and Levites concerning the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and, left, and have left plenty. There's plenty left over. For the Lord has blessed his people, and that which is left is this great store. So you want to be part of that generation that understood that the house of the Lord needs the offering of the Lord, and the people of the Lord need to be the givers of the, of the work of the Lord, and helping people in the community as well. So that's what we saw there. The temple needed to be built, be refurbished, and, and the priesthood supplied for it. So that's why that order was given it wasn't being done. Giving in the New Testament, you look at that's a little different. So I want to read that to you, some of this, and then we'll talk about it. We can look also to the New Testament to discover what generous giving looks like. When the early church was formed, we discovered something beautiful was happening. The church was learning how to give. 
Acts 2, 44 through 45. All believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. need. Acts 4, 32. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owed was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, and one of the apostles named Barnabas, nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles, gave the whole thing to, to the ministry so they could distribute it to the needy. The apostle Paul's encouragement for generous giving reads like this. Moreover, brothers, we want you to experience the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia and how in a great trial of affliction and abundance of joy, their deep poverty overflowed toward the riches of their generous giving. Even if you're in poverty, you can be a generous giver. But as you abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. What grace is he talking about? The grace of giving. The grace of becoming a generous giver. God encourages generous giving. We are to abound in this grace, the grace of being a generous giver. Paul continues, But this I say, he who sows sparingly, will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So if you hold back, you're going to be held back on. If you release and pour out abundantly, you'll be abundantly returned. Let every man give according to the purposes in his heart, not grudgingly, or out of necessity. So the Lord commands us to bring our offerings into the house of the Lord, our tithes. We're to do that joyfully, not begrudgingly, not resentfully. But to thank God that we have opportunity to give and be a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound toward you so that you, always having enough of everything, may abound to every good work. So you'll be supplied. You don't have anything to worry about. God will take care of you. Don't fear, what's going to, don't fear what it's going to cost you. God will make sure you have enough. He'll supply your grace and those items that you need. There's truth in this statement. You cannot outgive God. It's fun to try. But you'll never do it. The word is encouraging us to be cheerful givers. If we get a hold of this truth, then no missionary would ever go without, no poor person would remain among us, and no church would ever lack resources. The needs of the city would be addressed by the church. Generous giving is the new covenant, new covenant standard. God promises to reward those who are generous givers. His measuring stick is accessible, it's intriguing, and it's fascinating to me. He says in the word, the size of your blessing depends on you. Give, Luke 6, 38, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So give away your life, the message version reads. You'll find life given back, but not merely given back, given back with bonus, back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting is the way. Generosity begets generosity. Well, the Bible is saying what Jesus is telling us is every one of us has a scoop. It can be a big scoop or it can be a little scoop. Everyone has access to their own scoop. The size of the scoop depends on the person. Where are you right now? How big is your scoop? Think about it. The size of the scoop you use determines the size of the scoop God will use to restore what you gave away. The size you scoop with is scooped back on you. Some people haven't figured out that we reap what we sow. They talk about in sin, you'll reap what you sow. But it's also in harvesting souls and planting resources in the house of God, kingdom of God, you'll reap what you sow. In order to sow more, we've got to see more, reap more, we've got to sow more. God's promised to do more for you than you think you are doing for the church. God promises to do more for you than you, you are doing for the church or for others as you become aware of their need. So it's not just that we give, we also give of ourselves. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, how much to give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves the person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. 
then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources, and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So when we take your gifts, we're representing you. They were going to Jerusalem to help the poor and afflicted saints there. Last thing I want to tell you, generous giving is a function of discipleship. If you claim to be a disciple of Christ, then you also are a generous giver. The word tells us that we are to give liberally. Whatever scoop we use will be scooped back on us. So you want to use a big scoop. In our district youth director's teaching that I attended on a Zoom meeting recently, he was talking about finances, how to relate finances to the church and to young people especially, because he knows millennials and Gen Zs struggle with the concept of a tithe. He said the goal is discipleship, not revenue, not revenue generation. Make people aware giving us, giving us a function is a function of discipleship. Make people aware giving is a function of discipleship. Our job is to lead them into the discipleship of giving. Then Chris went on, tithing is Old Testament. New Testament is 100%. They brought real estate and sold and more. So if you're thinking 10% is a lot of God to ask, he gave 100% and set the standard for us to do the same. If Chris is right, and I believe he is, then we all have some ground to make up on. We all have room to improve. You see, it's impossible to be stingy and be a Christian. Oh, I've met some, but their heart's hard. Usually that's the case. Or they, un they were unlearned. They've never been taught tithing and giving. Uh, we're not afraid to teach it. We do it about once a year. This is my one-year shot for you. The attitude toward giving is what cost Ananias and their Sapphira their lives, their attitude. They sold a piece of land and wanted to do what Barnabas did. They wanted to look good. Barnabas didn't do it to look good. He did it because he wanted, his, out of his whole heart, purity, love of the Lord Jesus Christ, to give away this piece of land to the church. So Ananias and Sapphira thought, that looks pretty good. Maybe people don't think we're as spiritual as we ought to be, so we ought to do that. And so they did. They sold a piece of land, but they held back a portion of the proceeds and told the church, this is how much we received. Peter was full of the Holy Spirit, looked at them both. The man came in first. About three hours later, the wife came in, and she was faced with the same question. Is this how much you sold the land for? And I said, when he was there first, he said to Peter, yeah, that's how much we got for it. He said, you're lying to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will take your life right now. And he fell down dead. His wife came in three hours later, not knowing that her husband had died, and she was asked the same question. Is this how much you sold the land for? And she said the same answer, and she fell down dead. Peter told Ananias before he dropped dead, how was it you reasoned among yourselves to lie to the Holy Spirit about your giving? Did not the land belong to you? You could have kept the whole price. What kind of game were you playing? Those were the last words that Ananias and Sapphira heard. You've got to understand that tithing is the good thing and giving to the Lord whatever resources you feel led to give after your tither is up to you but it's going to bring blessing to your life. You see, it's impossible to be stingy and be a Christian. That's what cost them and I and Sapphira their lives. Chris even encouraged us to promote strategic giving and to simplify giving for the millennials and the Generation Z who struggle to tithe, understand tithing, but also who don't carry cash. They don't write checks. They're becoming a paperless society. So all of us need to learn how to give online and give electronically to the, to the kingdom of the Lord. Understand this, this, this church has set things up long ago so you can give very simply. You can go to our website, citychurchjaxel.com, click on the Give tab, follow the steps, instructions, and you'll be able to designate your giving electronically. We want to make it simple for you. We have not yet got text to give established, but we want to work on that, and we want to make it simple for you to be able to give through the week to the Lord. You can set up automatic or recurring giving through your bank or through 
PayPal or somewhere like that. But that way, whether you're out of town or miss a service, the amount you give each week when you are here in the sanctuary will keep coming in to support the work of the ministry. And that happens a lot. People miss a week and they just they don't give till they come back. So we want to encourage you to do all repetitive giving online so you're making sure the needs of the church and ministry are met. Giving is a function of discipleship. When you're here in the sanctuary, you want you to know the work of the ministry is going on. But when you cannot be here physically, you can still give to the offering. Watch us online and be part of what God is doing here. Giving is a function of being a disciple. That's good advice for all of us. Giving is a function of being a disciple. Why bother with all this today? Well, because the bottom line is many of you suffer financial hardships that you need not be suffering because no one ever taught you how to be generous. You've got to sow seed into the ground for a plant to come up, for a harvest to come up. You've got to give to the Lord as he leads you generously and liberally. Know that his standard is tithing and offerings. And that's what we need to understand, that we, he wants us to be generous givers. I know people here who have given very generously to other ministries and other people, and they are great and mighty wonderful people. They've given cars, they've given assets, they've given assistance, and they are just wonderful. To actually enjoy that level of giving is to enjoy the scoop. To know you've got a big scoop to scoop to a big God whose scoop is bigger than yours ever will be. And he can pour out blessing upon you without any hindrance. Sometimes what hinders our blessing is our own flesh and our own selfishness. It gets in the way. Our own bad attitude gets us in trouble. A person might think, as well as say, they're just after my money. Well, again, it's not your money. It's God's money. The resource comes from him. But we're not after your money. We're after you being blessed by the Lord. See, before we started tithing, we were in tremendous financial trouble. We were down 500 bucks a month in the red, and we were losing ground. We took some steps to correct that, got back on our feet, and then the Lord prompted us to begin tithing. And before we began tithing, there was always a car breaking down, there was a problem, the mechanics, washer dryer breaking down, there were different problems we faced. And once we began tithing, those things went away. My wife received a raise at her work, I received a promotion at my work. And I began to draw some commission later on. And every step of the way, every time we increased our giving, we saw increase coming back to us from the Lord. So that's why I'm telling you this today. I want you blessed. I don't want you to struggle in life. The Lord doesn't want you to struggle in life. He wants you to do well. And he wants you to be blessed so you can bless other people. The blessing of the Lord, I believe, is that you have enough to take care of your family and enough to minister to others as the Lord directs you. If you do like that, he'll, he'll honor your giving. He'll bless you. Don't just see what you can get by with. The heart that embraces the minimum toward the Lord can expect the minimum from the Lord. If motives are wrong, then priorities are wrong, and your relationship with Christ will suffer. All we can do is point you to the water. You'll decide whether or not you, have, you can drink. We can just offer you what we see in Scripture and testify to our own victories, our own experience, what we've seen in our lives. That testimony that we've set before you today should set before you a desire for a new level of giving, a new standard of giving, generous giving. Generous giving. So you shouldn't be thinking, are you not happy with the level we're giving? It's not about whether I'm happy. The question is, is the Lord happy? Is God happy with your level of giving? Are you holding back on the Lord? who's given us so much. We need to be generous givers, according to his word. And that's the word I want to give you today. That's why it's a new standard of giving. It's not just pay your tithe and be done. It's give more to the Lord. Give more to people in the community. Help people know that God is real and he's alive and he's powerful. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. So don't wait for the church to do all the giving through our benevolence fund. God will move upon you to bless people who need to be blessed. Don't worry about the tax donation, the tax benefit. Just give as God leads you to give. Minister to people in the way that they need it most. 
their most felt need, their most hurt is where they are, where they need somebody to come along beside them and give them a hand up and help them during those times. Why not start today with generous giving?